Hello everybody and welcome to Room 1 at NDC Oslo in virtual. Uh, my name's Leila Porter. This session is TDD and the Terminator, an introduction to test-driven development. Now, just a quick note, this is an introduction to TDD. If you are already a TDD whiz kid, you may want to pop over to any of the other amazing talks happening right now. Uh, you've still got plenty of time if an introduction to test driven development isn't for you. Uh, but if it is, then uh, let's begin. So, as I said, my name's Leila Porter. Uh, welcome to my home office. My, I am a Microsoft MVP. Uh, I organize my local .NET user group here in Milton Keynes, uh, which is about 60 miles north of London. I love C Sharp and I am a senior developer evangelist at Twilio. So uh, if you've not heard of Twilio, we're just a cloud communications platform. So feel free to find me on Slack and ask me some questions about it if you wish. Um, but you're probably asking yourself this question right now. Why TDD and the Terminator? And that's a very good question. And to answer that, I need to take you back to uh, a previous job of mine. It was quite a while ago now. And this was also at a communications company and we worked on, my team worked on a cloud platform that allowed carriers to manage communications and like their rating and routing of telephony. So it's quite a complicated system. Uh, so we worked on the platform that allowed them to manage it. And uh, we relied solely on a team of six testers. And by that, I mean, we didn't have a single unit test, not one, no integration tests, nothing. We just about had uh, UAT testing, which is user acceptance testing, um, but everything was based on this, this team of six testers. That worked out fine for me for a while. And then after one particular release, and our release cycles were sort of once a year, uh, we got to the point where we had nine weeks of regression bug fixing. So just let that sink in. Nine weeks of development, which was only fixing regression bugs. It was a bad time. Uh, and at this bad time, I thought there had to be a better way of doing things. Surely this couldn't be the way that quality software was written. And that's when I started to research different ways of doing things. And I came across TDD or test driven development. And I was like, yeah, this sounds right up my street. Definitely something I would like to watch. Oh, and I've just remembered if you're watching on YouTube, you can also watch on WebEx. Just remembered I was asked to say that and it just popped into my head. So uh, this is also on WebEx. So feel free to watch on there as well. But anyway, back to TDD. So I, I thought this is a much better way of doing things. I'm going to learn how to do TDD. Or more to the point, I'm going to attempt to learn because that's what it was. Uh, I didn't know where to start. I didn't find TDD very accessible. I felt the learning curve was really steep. I tried reading books. That didn't help. I tried watching YouTube videos and it was like magic happening on, on screen. I also watched Plural Sight and nothing really helped. And I was like, oh, I need something simple that I can build myself that will help me relate to the issue. And that's what I did. I'm a fan of the Terminator movies. So I created my own little tiny TDD Terminator app. And I have rewritten that and revamped it a little bit. And I'm going to share it with you in the aims that if you're stuck on how to get started with TDD or it just doesn't sink in, that this may help you just as it did me. So let's have a look at uh, some TDD successes. Uh, and the first one of those is acceptance criteria. Now, this is where you speak to the project or product owner or your project manager, and you really get them to define what the requirements for each feature are. And what does this 
mean really well it means that you don't have any wishy-washy requirements and you know exactly what your code should do and if you know exactly what your code should do then it's very easy to write tests for it uh, and so that's the first thing um, and this means that you have a greater understanding of what your code should do and once you've written your code you're not going to have your product manager or, or product owner come up to you and say well I didn't mean for it to do that I actually meant for it to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, so you save time and everybody has a clear understanding of what should be happening. So the next one, focus. Now as developers, we are prone to ADHD and uh, there's a term called shaving the yak and I've got the link to a good blog post on it at the end of the talk. So don't feel like you have to rush off and Google it now. Well, of course you could, but uh, the phrase shave in the yak, and once you know what it means, you'll be like, yes, that's exactly what I do. Uh, and what a lot of us do is, I need to implement this feature, but hang on, to implement this feature, I need to write this bit of code. Oh, but to write this bit of code, I need to update the database, and so on and so forth. And you just get on this endless to-do list, and you never actually get to do the thing that you really wanted to do. So focus, uh, and this means that you have distinct pieces of code functionality let's call it and you know exactly what you need to do to complete this little test so you write a test or a collection of tests and you say oh okay if i fulfill this bit of code that's it i keep focused all i have to do is write some code that fulfills this function and passes this test. So you don't go off anywhere else and looking at other things, you keep your focus. So uh, that's really helpful. So the next thing we have is interfaces. And you may be thinking, well, what's that got to do with TDD? Now, I'm, I'm a practical uh, person. So I have a very pragmatic approach to TDD rather than dogmatic. And a lot of people you'll see um, will be like, no, you just write the bare minimum of code. Uh, I like to write interfaces for my TDD. They're a coding contract. And when I'm working in a team, I can actually say to um, Clara, my teammate, here's my interface. This is what I expect my code to fulfill. And if you need to get on with your code, this is what my code will fulfill, even though you haven't written any of the functionality or the implementation of that interface, because you've written your tests and you know that your tests are going to fulfill that interface. Okay. So this leads on to a really useful aspect of TDD, and that's asynchronous development. And that means that I am not dependent on uh, Bob, who's working on a particular feature, to finish finish his feature before I can start working on mine. Uh, now at the old company where I used to work, um, we couldn't go and just pick something out the backlog. It was really, oh, well, actually that needs this story to be finished first. And oh, I need to make sure that that's changed and that's implemented. So you're constantly picking through the backlog and seeing what you actually can do rather than just grabbing one that fits your time frame and your interest or your skill set and getting on with it. So having interfaces and proper small pieces of code and all of the above will help you be an asynchronous development team. And because you're focused and you have coding contracts, you have cleaner code because you're only writing enough code to pass a test. You're not going off and shaving that yak and doing everything else that you think you need to do. You are simply writing enough code to pass the test. So you don't get bloat or unnecessary code or, or code where it shouldn't be. You just get lovely, clean code. This one is one of my favorites, safe refactoring. Now, remember those nine weeks of fixing regression bugs? I wouldn't have had it if we had tests because if as soon as you regress your code, your tests don't pass. So you get an idea straight away that you have made a regression bug and you don't have to wait till release day to find out that by working in a particular area, you've broken a whole nother area. So safe refactoring is a massive factor for 
tests. And I will just put that caveat in. Some of these things are um, not just restricted to test-driven development, but unit testing in general. So just having unit tests allows you to have safe refactoring. So that definitely leads on to fewer bugs, which everybody loves, fewer bugs. And of course, if you have fewer bugs, you're spending less time fixing bugs and more time implementing new features and, and developing a better product. So you get increasing returns, which makes everybody happy. And the final point I'm going to raise is living documentation. Now, tests are not a replacement for documentation. However, they are a really good start. If you have a new developer join your team, if they go and read all of your tests, which should have descriptive names, they can understand what your code is meant to do. Um, you can also build your actual documentation from your tests. So it really helps in so many different ways having tests. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's go back to the Terminator and have a look at how we apply some of these things to our Terminator app. And the very th first thing we want to look at is the process. And what is the first thing in our process? Well, that's gathering the requirements. Let's have a look at how we're gonna gather our requirements for our Terminator app. Okay, so we have a boy on a motorbike and we're having a look at him, we're investigating him further and we've actually identified him positively as John Connor and we, we really need to investigate John Connor further because uh, he's a target. Uh, so from that, we can derive a couple of requirements. And the first one is scan subjects and determine if they require further investigation. And the second one is in investigate subjects of interest and determine if they are indeed the target and then terminate them. We're going to focus on the top one, scan subjects, and determine if they require further investigation. So that seems like a really nice um, requirement to start with, nice and, and succinct as well. So what we need to do now is start with failing tests. And these failing tests um, mean that you haven't got any code written because you can't pass tests if there's no code. So it's a really good start to uh, test-driven development. Um, and this is important. When you write tests after coding, you may be writing them to fit your code and not your requirements. And what I mean by this is imagine you've written an API endpoint and it returns 200 and content. And then you go and write a test that tests to see if your code returns 200 and some content. Your tests pass everything you think is hunky-dory. But actually, when you go and look at the documentation, it's not meant to return 200 and content, it's just supposed to return a 204. And your tests have passed. And any Thing you change will fail your test. So, you know, you think everything is okay, but it doesn't actually fit your requirements. So unless you're cross-checking your tests with your requirements, you could be writing them to fit your code. Now, if you write your tests first, the only thing you've got to go on is the requirements. So you would look at your requirements, go, right, this has to return a 204, and you write the tests to check that it's returning a 204. So uh, that's a really valid reason for doing TDD. Okay, I like to use the red-green refactor pattern. And what that means is we write a failing test and uh, we write enough code to get the test passed. So the failing test is red when your test passed it goes green and then we can refactor. And that's a really nice iterative process that you can keep doing. And uh, we're gonna go over to code and have a look at what that looks like. So uh, let's go this way. And here I have a simple application. Uh, this is just built off a template. It's nothing uh, fancy. 
<clears throat> and I do have the GitHub repo for this as well, which you can have the links at the end of the talk. Um, I will just say uh, I'm not checking Slack or anything. If you have questions, please just uh, save them for the end and uh, there'll be time at the end for me to go through and answer them. Um, so let's have a look at what I've got in this code. The first thing we're going to look at is this interface called iSubject. And this has one property uh, called subject name. I have an implementation of that called subject, um, pretty straightforward. And then I have an I subject analyzer. Now, if you remember, our requirement was, should we go and investigate a person further? So we've got this being a bool, yes or no, and investigate further. And we're gonna pass them in a subject. And over here, we have our test class. Now, I use NUnit in this particular instance. I, I like NUnit. You could use XUnit. Um, there are many arguments for using XUnit because it's more maintained um, and it's more modern. Uh, you can, of course, use the Microsoft testing framework as well. Uh, I've used all of them. I just happen to like NUnit and I've put this one in here. XUnit is very similar, uh, just slightly different decorators, but they all do roughly the same thing. So what we have is test fixture here is part of uh, N unit and it's saying this is going to be a test class. And once we go in here, you'll see I have this uh, private of I subject analyzer. So that's this interface here. And I've called that SUT and that stands for subject under test. Calling the class that you're testing something such as SUT differentiates it from many other dependencies. So perhaps this class uh, subject analyzer is dependent on multiple classes. If I have all of those in here, because I'll need them, and they've all got their class names, by calling this SUT, it just keeps it clear that this is the class that I'm testing. So it's just, uh, it makes life easier. Next, uh, we have this setup, and this is where I can set anything up that I want to use throughout all of my test methods. Uh, you can set stuff up in each uh, test method, but if it's something you're going to be using again and again, it's nice to set it up at the beginning. And this is where the frameworks differ slightly. I particularly like this way of doing it with NUnit. So what we need to do is actually create an instance of SUT. So we'll come here, SUT is equal to new, and I don't have an implementation of I subject analyzer. So, all right, we need to create one of those. So let's come over here to services, and I'm gonna add one in here. So we'll have a new file, and we'll call that, we won't have a new file, we'll have a new class. And we're going to call that subject analyzer. Um, I often get asked what IDE I'm using. I'm using uh, JetBrains Rider. Um, I happen to like this, as you may have noticed, I'm on a Mac and uh, I find it's really good for development on a Mac. Uh, it's very similar to Visual Studio with uh, ReSharper on. I like the testing framework from ReSharper as well, so um, I just happen to use it, but it doesn't make any difference to what we're doing. So I've now got this class called Subject Analyzer, and it implements iSubjectAnalyzer, but it doesn't really implement it because we haven't said implement missing members. So what we do when we get an implemented interface is we'll get something that looks like this. And it says, throw new system not implemented exception. And that's absolutely fine. We don't need to change any code yet because we haven't written a test yet. So leave it like this. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. And let's go back to our tests. So now that we've got the implementation, I can go new subject analyzer. And this is now ready for us to use and test. <clears throat> so down here, I've got our Requirements scan subjects and determine if they require further investigation. And uh, so let's go and write our first test. And that's going to be a public void. And what we're going to say is terminator should uh, determine to investigate. Well, let's go look for Sarah Connor. Uh, let's have investigate woman further. 
Okay. So uh, just a note on naming of uh, your test methods. Many people will delimit each word like so with an underscore. I find that harder, but you may prefer it. Um, but what I like to do is have what, what we're doing, what the thing is, what it should do, and then sort of the end part. So I like to divide it up into um, three parts. And you'll see as I name more methods what that looks like. And what we need to do is make this discoverable to our testing framework. So this is with another decorator, and this is called test. And you can see now I've got this little play button here and you can see it's going to run my tests and we'll get to that in a moment. So there's a few things that we need to think about when we write a test and that is we need to arrange, we need to act and then we need to assert. And so the action is going to be actually the test method. So that is going to be var uh, result is equal to um, sut dot investigate further and you can see that we've got a red squiggle here which means we need something in here and that's going to go into our, our range if we go look here it wants a subject so let's create a subject our subject is equal to a new subject and let's initialize it here as well and bring in the missing Usings, and that has a subject name and let's call that woman because we're going to look for a woman as it says up here in our test method and now we can pass that subject in and I happen to know that if we're looking uh, for people to investigate further because we're looking for Sarah Connor we need to investigate a woman we see further in case she's Sarah Connor so then we want to go result dot uh, i use fluent assertions so that's going to be should uh, be true and i quite like fluent assertions because they're nice and readable let's bring that up a little bit um but you don't have to you can use the built-in um assertions that we're going to have a look at in a a little bit we'll we'll use one of those so result dot should be true so very quickly someone can come along and go terminator should determine to investigate woman further, and we can see what this is. So let's go and run our test. Now, I'm gonna run them from up here first because it's the first time we're doing them and I want it to go through. And of course it wants to do that because I clicked run rather than tests, run unit tests. So we've now got our testing um, window up here. And you can see everything's red. So we've got our red part of our red green refactor, which is perfect. Um, and you can see here, it's looking at the classes. If I had more classes, they'd all be listed here and then inside the individual methods. And it tells you what's wrong. If I uh, move that across, you can see that it says it's not implemented, which is exactly what we would expect. So let's go back to our class and remember our number one rule. We only want to implement enough code to get our test to pass. Uh, now, as I said, I can't see Slack, but feel free to all scream it out in Slack if you know the answer. And um, so the simplest thing we can write here to get the test to pass is return true. And that was a massive aha moment to me, okay? I was like, that can't be right. But we come back now, and if I run all the tests down here, we'll let that do its thing, green. And that was like an amazing aha moment for me, that I just write return true, and that's the start of TDD. So let's get on. So uh, let me zoom out a little bit here. We're going to go and write another method. Uh, let's think about if we see a T1000. I'm sorry if you're not into the Terminator movies, you're going to get a lot of jargon that you might not understand. Um, so if we see a T1000, let's think we're in Terminator 1 now. We're hunting John and Sarah Connor. So is a T1000. I know I've munged the movies together, but forgive me. And um, 
we're not interested in them because they're on the same side as us. So let's have a look. Terminator should determine not to investigate further. And I'm not worried what this particular thing is. We're going to say a T1000. Uh, pass that in. And now we're just going to update this to be false because we're not interested in investigating a T1000. All right, let's run our code. Actually, if I run them all, we can have a look at what we've got down here. You can see it's already discovered that second test, and that one's failed. So let's go and write just enough code to get our test to pass. So let's come back in here. What I'm going to do is just cut that. And if subject dot subject name is equal to woman, or oh, a lovely bit of string matching here, um, will return true, otherwise will return false. And uh, I will just say that I hope nobody ever programs a terminator by string matching. Okay, <laughs> we're not going to do that. Um, but it works for demonstration purposes. So now we've got this, let's run our tests again. Boom, they're all green. You're liking this. Let's go back over here. So now we've, we've seen John Connor. So that's a boy we want to investigate further. So I could go and copy this whole method again and, and paste it and do it, but it's going to get a little bit tedious. So what we're going to do is update this method to take multiple test cases. So let's start by renaming it. Who should we investigate further? And we're going to change this decorator to be a test case. And in here, we're going to say a woman. And we can add as many test cases as we want to here. And you can have loads of them. And immediately, if you notice down here in our test explorer, I've now got this set of subtests under this one, Terminator should determine to investigate further. So we've got two tests in there, boy and woman. We've not run those tests yet, so they've got question marks. And how we get those in is we add them as arguments. So string, and we'll call this one subject name. And then what we need to do is just where we've got woman down here, we'll just say that subject name is equal to subject name. And uh, these are all going to be true, okay? And we'll come to how we can update this further um, back in slides. So let's go and run all of our tests. And you can see the one for boy has failed. So let's go back. Now you're probably going, oh, why didn't you just do the switch statement here or something? But that would break our rules. We're only writing enough code to pass our tests. Um, so I'm just going to do a really lovely, I mean, this is gorgeous, isn't it, folks? Don't worry, we will refactor. Um, so that, let's run. It's just enough code to get my tests to pass, hopefully. And there. So you can see really clearly how we've quickly started to build up code. Um, I'm not saying that this is particularly nice code, um, but we've got two tests and we've written our code. So let's now go back to the slides and see what we can do further. So I want to go this way and let's continue. So now that we've got the basics in there and we've got our tests, we can start to safely refactor. And this is really key. And um, let's go and have a look at what we've got. So imagine now I've added in um, tests for a girl and a man. We want to go and investigate them all. So here's my lovely stack of if statements. And uh, I've gone and made a switch, not a fancy new C sharp 8 switch just a plain old basic switch. Uh, so we safely refactored that. And um, if we have a look at our test coast, our test class here, you can see that I've got all of those test cases stacked. Okay, so that all works. And if I look at my uh, bottom class there, the uh, terminator should determine not to investigate further, that's fine too. But now, 
requirement change. Let's see what this one is. Okay, so Sarah Connor's doing something funny with um, the Terminator's head. They, oh, this is interesting. And oh, it looks like he can learn things. Now, um, if you have not seen the director's cut of Terminator 2, this will be an unfamiliar scene to you. This is only in the director's cut. And a little bit of uh, trivia there is the head you see in the foreground, the back of the head is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's stunt double, and the arm is Linda, Linda Hamilton's sister. So this hand closest to us is Linda Hamilton's sister. Uh, so just a little bit of uh, movie trivia there. So they switched his chip to from read only so he can learn things so our new requirements are protect john and sarah connor from threats and an ability to learn so let's go back and have a look at our code so this all still looks fine we've got a nice success it's green um but we've got terminator should determine not to investigate further um but now we want to, because if we see a T-1000, they're a potential threat to John and Sarah. So we need to investigate them further. So if we update our switch and say, yes, we want to investigate T-1000, we get this error, expected result to be false, but found true. So now what am I faced with doing? Well, I'd have to go and modify my tests. But I don't want to. So we should design applications to be more robust. Because we shouldn't have to go in there and fiddle with things as soon as a requirement changes. That's tedious. And that's not why we have all this safe refactoring and things. And to make software more robust, you can look at design patterns. Um, now, anyone who uh, has known me for a while will know that my Twitter uh, bio used to say, so solid. Okay, uh, at the moment, I am championing Black Lives Matter. So uh, I have that on my Twitter bio at the moment. But previously, I had so solid because I am a big advocate for solid, but this isn't going to turn into a solid talk. So never fear. We're going to have a look at them briefly, though. So in case you don't know what solid is, uh, here it is. It's the single responsibility principle, the open close principle, the list of substitution principle, the interface segregation principle, and the dependency inversion principle. Now, we've already done some of these, um, and we'll, we'll cover that in a moment, but we're really interested in the top three, soul, or the sunny side, as I like to call it. Let's look at these closer. So the single responsibility means that every class or module in a program should have a responsibility for just a single piece of that program's functionality. Now, if you think about that from our requirements, if you've got multiple things happening in a class, multiple pieces of functionality, how do you test that? How do you know which is the failing piece of this big method? If I take you back to the company I used to work for, we had controllers uh, and with a controller method in there that was 800 lines of code. And it had so much functionality going on there. You wouldn't even know where to start to debug that. We had breakpoints galore everywhere. It was a nightmare. I wouldn't inflict it on my enemies. Or maybe I would, maybe I would, but anyway. So this is really key principle that you just have that single piece of functionality. And on to open close principle. Software entities such as classes, modules, functions, etc., should be open for extension, but closed for modification. What does that mean? When I first saw this, I was like, I don't understand. I don't get it. How can it be open for extension, but closed for modification? I don't get it. Well, I'm going to show you in a moment a, a sort of example of how this works that can be amazing for keeping your code in a really good functional way uh, that you don't have to go and rewrite your tests or anything. OK, and we're going to do it in a moment. Uh, and the final one we're looking at is the Liskov substitution principle. Uh, 
objects should be replaceable with instances of their subtypes without altering the correctness of that program. Uh, and that's going to be key for what we're going to do in a moment. Um, we've already seen that we can have multiple impl implementations of a certain interface, and the tests should all still work similarly. So let's see this in action. We'll come over and refactor our code. Alrighty. So this is what we've got. We've got our terminator should determine to investigate further, and we've got the four test cases. And then we have the one for the T100, uh, T1000 rather. So I am going to rewrite those two tests into this one test on the right hand side. So what we've done now is we've added some more arguments and let's step through. So let's take that first decorator test case and we've got woman and true and they map to those two arguments string subject name and bool outcome and then the subject name works just the same. We pass that into our new subject and then the outcome is in our results. So this is now not uh, fluent assertions. We're going into the regular assertions and result dot equals the outcome. OK, so you can see there that we've actually got the test case with the T1000. We're no longer going to investigate uh, the girl or the man. We can put whatever we like in here and as many test cases as we want, and they should all work in the code in the same way. And as you can see, they do. So we've got all of those uh, passing based on our current code. So let's go and have a closer look at how we can refactor this code even further. Um, so let's see what we've got at the moment. We have our public bool method called investigate further that takes a subject and that currently has that rather delightful switch. We have our i subject and we have our implementation of i subject. Um, and what I'm proposing we add is this. Now this interface down here in the bottom right is called I subject rule. And I'm going to create a rule set and we can do all of this because we've got our lovely tests in there first. And this has two methods is match. So does this rule match the subject name coming in? And then if it does, is the subject of interest? So let's now have a look at how we write those rules based on our code. So on the left, we have our current code with the switch. And on the right, we have our first implementation of, a, of an I subject rule. And that's the is woman rule. If we look at our switch, we can say that if there's a woman, is it of interest? And you can see, yes, it is. We'll return true. And then we've got the is match method, which will take the subject and using a little bit of um, very dodgy link here, it's going to <laughs> have a look and see if that matches. Now, of course, I know that if you um, had a man rule and you pass woman, yes, woman contains man and it gets messy, but just forget that. <laughs> This rule could be anything. You could be heading on over to cognitive services and getting a, um, a certainty back from them on whether a, a subject is a woman. And based on that um, certainty going and investigating, it doesn't matter what this is match is, um, it, it's going to work the same way. So we're just going to use um, string matching here. Uh, do not build a terminator by matching on strings, please, please don't. Uh, but it, it's good for demonstration purposes. Um, so now we have an is dog rule and dogs are lovely. And so we don't need to investigate them further. So you can see that our of interest method is going to return false here. OK, so we can go and pull out as many rules as you like, and they all have to implement I subject rule. That is the key. So I've got the investigate further method on the left and I have it on the right now, but you can see I've added some more code to my subject analyzer class. And we're going to step through this because you're thinking, wow, that switch just looks lovely now. Can we not go back to the switch? No, 
we can't. We're going to go through and have a look at how we can refactor our code to be much more extensible. So I'm going to bring up those rules on the left and let's start to step through our code and with those in mind. So the first and most important thing we've added is this collection of I subject rules and we've just called that underscore subject rules and it's very important that this is I subject rules because now we can have any implementation of I subject rule added to this collection which is what we do in the constructor. So we've now got a constructor. We have, um, we've instantiated subject rules and you can see that's a new list of I subject rule. And now we can add our women rule and our dog rule. So here is where you can do your extension or your extensibility. We can just keep adding new rules. Okay. And we'll show you that in a moment. So let's go down and look at our investigate further method. The signature is exactly the same, so our tests should work exactly the same. Um, so we take that subject in, and the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to get a rule. Out of our collection of rules, we want to pluck the relevant rule out. So we use a little bit of a link here, and we use an expression to access our is match rule from our um, for example, is woman rule on the left, and we pass in our subject, and that will either return uh, true or false. And if it's true, we're going to pluck that out, and now we've got our rule. So say our subject is a, a woman, we pass that into the investigate further, that rule is going to be true, and we get that is woman rule. And then we pass that rule into our investigate further uh, our investigate method. Now that's a private method and it will have a note on private methods at a moment. So we pass that rule in and then we can straight away call the of interest and that will tell us whether it's true or false. And that means investigate further will return true or false. So we've tidied that up very easily without a big switch. Now, I think if we did use a switch and we had loads more things that we needed to investigate, that switch is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we don't want that. We've already seen it grow from two to four and so on. Um, so we definitely, this, this makes it a lot easier. But back to private methods. If you need to make a private method public in order to test it, then it's time to refactor. Now, imagine we're working asynchronously and I have been given an interface by Clara. Clara has implemented all of her stuff using that interface and everything's going great. And I go, well, I really need to test this private method here that I need. So I'm going to add it to the interface so I can test it. But I've just broken all of Clara's code and she's like, well, I don't need this. So I'm not going to do an implementation. So she just leaves it as throw new not implemented exception. Now I have seen classes that have 20 or 30 of these methods with throw new not implemented exception. Um, and that's a real code smell. It's unnecessary code bloat. Now all your tests, well, you can't write tests for this because, well, they're not doing anything. They're all gonna fail. Um, so this is really not great. Now, if I do want to make my private method public, I should write a second interface for it, which brings me on to the I in solid, the interface segregation principle. And this splits interfaces that are very large into smaller and more specific ones so that implementations will only have to know about the methods that are of interest to them. So now I can implement two interfaces on my class, but Clara just needs to implement the one. And we share that one, but the additional stuff that I need, I just make a separate interface for it. Uh, and so that's a really tidy way of being able to look after your code and keep it clean and minimalistic. So let's have a look at our code now. So we've implemented this change. You can see we've got that collection in our constructor. Um, and then down here, we've got our 
public method, the investigate further, and we've got our investigate private method. And now when we pass in those two rules, um, test those test cases, dog and woman, we get it all passing. Now, as I said, this is extensible. It fulfills the open close principle. So it's open to extension, but closed to modification. As I get new rules, all I have to do is add them to the collection. My code in Investigate Further doesn't need to change. It's closed for modification. We're not modifying that any further, but I can keep adding new functionality by adding new rules. Um, and you may be thinking, where do I use this? Well, I have recently did this for a notification handler. Uh, so you could have notification rules based on different criteria, what type of notification is sent. Uh, so you don't need to go through an if statements, you just have a rule and, and it will go through. Um, so it's a really good way of making code totally extensible. And with that, good practices and code management becomes infinitely easier. So you don't need to worry about refactoring tests and refactoring your methods. You can just extend till your heart's content. So that's fantastic. Um, so let's have a look at TDD failures. And this is specifically through you know, the learning of TDD and implementations and things. And the biggest one is underestimating the learning curve. So if you think that you can pick up TDD in a day, maybe you can, but a lot of people are gonna be going, um, um, I don't know how to start. Um, and so underestimating that learning curve can be a real issue. And it can be really disheartening as well if you think, am I being really stupid here? Is that surely this is easy? It's not. It's a complete cultural change, uh, a massive change to the way you think as well. Many people confuse TDD with unit testing. Um, so I've done Twitter polls and asked people, well, do you do TDD? And they're like, yeah, well, I, I write my code and then I write my unit test. I'm like, no, that's just testing. It's not TDD. Uh, TDD is specifically writing those failing tests before you write a single line of code. And um, another failing is thinking TDD is enough testing. So my previous job, we were all TDD, but we only had TDD with unit testing. We didn't have integration tests. We didn't have um, a testing team. We didn't have UAT testing. Um, so we just depended wholly on unit tests and TDD. And I'm sure you've seen enough memes about um, unit tests versus integration tests. Uh, not starting with failing tests. That's a code smell. If your tests immediately pass, uh, then you know you probably haven't written your test first because how is your, your test going to pass if you've not written your code? Um, and then not refactoring enough, being lazy and not, you know, making that private method public and tacking it onto Clara's interface and screwing over her code. Um, you don't want to over engineer, but you want to make stuff uh, refactored enough to be maintainable. Uh, and obviously, you know, if something's going to be changed again and again, or, or hopefully with the scope. And basically, the rule is you can refactor something once. And if you come to refactor it a second time, then you should be thinking about what you should make uh, do to make it more maintainable. OK, um, and not actually doing TDD. I'm really, um, when I started, I was really uh, falling foul of this one. So remember, we had that switch and I said, just return true. Well, I wouldn't just return true. I'd be like, oh, well, I need a switch here. So I'd write my big switch and I'd be like, oh, let my test pass. And then I'd be like, right, what's my next test? So I'd write another test. Oh, it, it passed. Oh, I've already written my code. So I'm not actually doing TDD anymore. I'm writing unit tests after the fact. So you have to be quite strict when you do TDD. Uh, and, you know, that, that's difficult. Um, so let's have a look at implementation within your organization. It can be controversial and is a significant cultural change. So 
you may, when you implement it, you may start to really slow down on your output and your product manager is going to be like, what's going on? Why, why is this all changing? So that can lead to an initial drop in productivity, which is my next point. But it can be controversial. Not everyone is going to be on board. Um, so you need to be kind and patient and help people make the cultural change. And it may be that people just don't want to do TDD certain members of the team and be prepared that they're going to move on um, because it's not for everybody. Um, you know, be, be sort of open-minded about things. So as I said, it can give an initial drop in productivity and that can be really disconcerting. If you've got a high performing team and suddenly you've halved the, um, the number of stories in their sprint, uh, or they, you haven't halved it yet, you've got the same number of things and they're now not finishing everything in the sprint. That can be disconcerting. They're like, why are we so um, down on all of this? Uh, why are we not progressing still? So, you know, you really need to be mindful that this could be a really disconcerting time for your developers. Um, but if you stick with it, and you get past this lack, this drop in productivity, and you speak to your uh, product manager and tell them what's happening, you will get a productivity increase. It will go up and your reworks will be reduced. So you'll get less bugs and you'll get faster and faster and faster. But you have to be prepared for that initial slump and um, reduction in productivity. But once you're going, the, the productivity just skyrockets because you're not creating all those blood, bugs. So you get an increased understanding of requirements and their acceptance criteria. So your relationship with the product manager or the product owner becomes far better because you're saying, no, I haven't got enough information here to write the code. So you're putting the onus on them to go and really think about how the product should work, what they need, and then coming back to you and going, this is what it should do. So you, everybody has a greater understanding. So you won't get those um, bugs where you say, well, this didn't do what I wanted it to do. So basically, if you take one thing away from this talk, well, let's say two, let's go back here um, and think about the implementation. I just want to say, be kind and patient. That's a really big thing, okay? Be kind and patient. It's a big culture of change um, and don't expect it to happen overnight and just communicate with everybody um, and that should go much better for you. So on to the, if you take one thing away from this talk, and this is going back to my big aha moment. And that's if you have code that looks like this, you wanna return true. Write the least amount of code to get your test to pass. And if that means return true, just return true. Okay. Don't be afraid to do it. This blew my mind. Um, every time I've given this talk, someone has come up to me and said, that was either their aha moment when they learned TDD, or it was their aha moment within this talk. So I hope that that has helped some of you understand TDD a little bit more. Um, and with that, I want to say a huge thank you um, to all of you for joining me, uh, to every one of the organizers, uh, to my host in the room, um, and making what is a massive conference that um, I've been to the last few years in Oslo and taking it on to a, a super interactive event online. So um, a massive thank you to everybody. Um, so here are some things about me. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, Leila Kodza. Uh, this repo you can get on that bit.ly link, TDD Terminator, or you can find it on my GitHub where it's Layla p uh, This deck is available um, on that link there. Uh, I am on Twitch. I'm part of the Live Coders team. Um, so you can watch me on Twitch where I predominantly talk about uh, Azure Functions on a Monday and General C Sharp on a Thursday. I will be adding in some more uh, scheduling as well in the coming weeks. So uh, feel free to catch me on Twitch. Um, and as I promise, if you want to know more about shaving the yak, you can check out that link.